Hey guys, it's Girl Got Game. Welcome back to London Detective Mysteria for our final time because we are here to do our final epilogue called The Grand After, The Eve of London's New Age. So let's get started and see what is left. I'm freaking getting my Mycroft. That's all I care about. <laughs> it's gonna finally happen. All right. And whatever other mysteries get solved are left open for future solving, hopefully, we'll find out in due time. Let's just see what happens. What do you got? What do you got for me? <laughs> Ooh, so pretty. Chandeliers glistened in the line along the ceiling. Music, which appeared to have no player, rumbled into my ears. And here I stood at the center of a ballroom floor. This is a dream. And you're like, I can't choose who I want to dance with. This room extended into brilliance with no exit in sight, and its lighting was not the orange kiss of sunrise, but the harsh white glare of midday. I blinked to adjust. It was to no avail. Take care not to get lost, my lady. It is always the moment I take my eyes off you that you scamper off to the nearest crime with all the zeal of a puppy with no lead. <laughs> I rather like puppies and their boundless energy. I'm your assistant! It's only right that I assist you. I want to help you however I can. I listen to the music, to nothing else, and then... Voices. A sea of them, and several amongst them were ones I knew. So many sparkles. That dress suits you right down to the ground, Emily. Isn't it pretty, Akachi? It's beautiful. I see you and find myself wondering if you're the same schoolmate I've always known. Oh, okay. We dream of these boys in their alternate outfits. I like. <laughs> Our girl's got good taste. And yet, it would not be so beautiful were it not worn by her. How alluring our princess is. Never have I so strongly wished to tour the world outside this hall with another. And never have I more strongly wished you'd shut up. <laughs> Even in dreams, Jack is straight to the point. When I opened my eyes to chance the light, there was no one. It was bodiless chatter partnered by an ever brighter sight that blurred my vision. Ah, oh, the blinding light of adult Watson <laughs> fills my gaze. <laughs> Even in this, you're just so big. What is it, Emily? I'm not feeling ill, I hope. I'm all right. The light's just a bit too bright for my eyes. How do you still serve as one of Her Majesty's detectives when you prance about as though you've two left feet? I suspect a common drunkard may know how to dance better than you. I may well stomp on you with those two left feet if you keep that up. I can do anything I set my mind to. She's right, Holmes. It won't hurt to admit that she's always had a gift for working till she's made her mark. <laughs> I sooner believe she'll make a mark on the ballroom floor with all her stamping. Well done, my lady. <laughs> Even in my dreams, Holmes and Jack are just so blunt. Uh. My friends could be heard, quite to my relief in this unfamiliar place, before something bid their sound to fade. I strained to listen, hoped for more of their attention. The incoherent chatter of the masses married into the voices of the individuals till there was nothing more to comfort me. <laughs> Wait! I wanted to follow them. I reached forward, stretching my hand. Oh. My. God. I'm trying not to scream right now, but I just got goosebumps. <laughs> I'm in love again. And you don't have a root, and we're at the end, and I'm never going to get to know you, am I? This is just going to be a taste, and I'm going to come away from this feeling so sad that I can't smooch you. What is my life? Why am I like this? Guys. Guys, I need you to be the homes to my Emily and tell me that I'm dumb. <laughs> I, need, I need a cold bucket of water thrown on me. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, uh. All right, well, 
let, let's do this. Good day to you, lovely lady. Ah! And who would receive it? Not a friend. Not an acquaintance. No confidant I care to have take it, but rather a man with a strange air and a smile that unsettled more than assuaged. Care to dance, my dear? There's little point in a party like this if you aren't going to indulge a bit, is there? Who are you? Who am I? A fine question. <laughs> he laughed as to provoke a rose-colored blush on my cheeks. I need to I need to see this for science. I just, I, I just need this for science? This is good for science. Okay, that's nice. Very nice. This man pulled me into a handsome embrace and took lead with the first step. He intended to make use of me as a dancing partner, and though I was winded by the sudden invitation, there was no time to refuse him. We danced. I do not know you, and you do not know me. And to know nothing of one another is, in my opinion, the most agreeable way for us to be. Need I explain more? He smiled again, and again I was unsettled. The nerve of this man! This fellow! This beast! I turned my back to him. So you choose to look away. You, young woman, are a half-wit. What? This is how I meet you! This is how I meet you! How dare you, first of all. Second of all, how dare you! Why are you so tall? You're as tall as Watson the Big! Uh, nothing prepared me for this epilogue. I beg your pardon? When I turned round to speak my last words, he was gone in a way that I pondered if he were ever there. In his place stood a man taller than my former dance partner. Do you dare provoke me by calling me a halfwit? I only called you what I saw fitting. Have I displeased you? Displeased me? That isn't the half of it! That's no way to speak to anyone, you... You! You're as vulgar as Holmes! Indeed, you could almost say they're related in some fashion. I don't know what way, but I want answers. Also, why we're dreaming of boys we never met before. Girl, I got questions for you. And the same to you, for the comparison brings insult to my person. A pity that you lack matters in addition to wit. I assume you fantasize playing detective much like my cousin. It must be so, for fools only seek to befriend fellow fools. Oh my goodness, thank you. I finally got my answer. I know this is a dream. He could be li- Dream Mycroft could be lying. But it bugged me forever. Because I was so worried that sh the Sherlock Holmes had had two sons and named the first one after his brother that he couldn't stand. And then named his second son after himself but removed a letter. I would have been so peeved if that was the case. I am so pleased that Mycroft also had a son, and so Mycroft and Herlock are actually cousins in this. That is so much better for me. Oh, I can, I can breathe easy. That's one of my big mysteries in life solved. I'm glad. Don't speak of our work as if it's some game. Holmes and I are doing what we must to help those in need. Spare me your sophistry. What are you doing here, then? Speak, woman. As a detective of this nation's proud queen, what have you accomplished in her service? I... The question, for it was too direct, pierced my heart. I had an answer. Certainly I had one, and yet it stayed within, caught, between, caught beneath the point of his dagger and struggling for liberty. As the music distorted and the chandeliers above were snuffed of their grand luminescence, the ballroom floor shattered beneath me. Into this darkness I sank, falling, falling, falling. Ah! I sprang upwards. My breathing was at a terrible rhythm. The reason for this I could not say. What was my dream about? The more I reached, the more I was left with a lingering sense of misery. 
I can't believe she dreamed about two guys she never met before. That is... That is magical. Once my breathing had calmed, I left my bed and walked to the window. The cold wreathed all. I could only see one thing, no matter how far off into the distance I looked, that being the dull grey cityscape of London. The glass, tempered by the cold outside, prickled the tips of my fingers as I grazed against it to observe the white sky. It's snowing again. They must still be in school at this hour, but here I am. <sighs> as I sighed, a knock came from the door. How are you feeling, my lady? Well enough, but may I... may I be left alone for now? Of course. Just know that you have but to ask if there's anything you need. I listened as his footsteps grew quieter, then slumped beneath the sheets of my bed. My entire body was weak, heavy. My chest heaved with the clunkedness of one who had taken ill. Why did it come to this? It had been three months since that Christmas party spent with schoolmates. Christmas was a lovely holiday that came and went. Celebrations for the new year were much the same. As was customary, a fresh term was to greet us at Harrington Academy. Oh, sorry, clock. I should like to have gone. What fun to see my schoolmates again! What delight that would come in discussing our holidays through excited conversation, detailing gifts and traditions, and oh, so many other things. What tidings I would learn by my eager ear. But it was not to be. When we faced those treasures beneath the British Museum, the professor said those close to Her Majesty supported his plan. If what he said is true, then the royal family is overlooking a crime. Or worse, they may be one of its conspirators. I believed with all my heart in Her Majesty's wish to help those whose lives are thrown in turmoil by evil. Then I learned of those who use her ring to strengthen that same evil, to strengthen themselves with the likes of ourselves, of the Yard, cannot touch them. The darkness in London is simply too great for us to set to right. Has everything I've done today been part of some game? Am I so insignificant in my actions that even my proudest accomplishments are nothing in the greater sequence of events? Emily breaking the fourth wall there. We can do this, I once urged myself, spurning trepidation. When we celebrated Christmas together, I believed this was absolution before the trepidation made to return with a vengeance. I was then tormented, overwhelmingly so by my lack of power. I would gaze upon my ring and wonder the same things once, twice, thrice, incessantly. Depression seized me in this period. A fog would plague me, perverting my mind as my health worsened. I did not attend school for three days. Three days turned into a week. Two weeks. Three weeks. Four. The entire month. In this manner did three months pass. Huh. Why? I mean, she did learn a lot of stuff that has been on her mind and on her heart for years since the night of the murder. But was there more? Is there more to this illness than that? It is natural for fatigue to build in this way since our move from the countryside. But I... I need to go to school! <coughs> My lady, to attend school now would risk your health. Might you consider waiting until you've recovered fully? Pendleton showed great consideration for me during this period. He saw me as I was, a person in a state of grieving, and never questioned my inner burdens. He never added to them. I know I can't remain shut in here forever. I do. I wonder what my friends must think. How did they feel upon learning of the invisible force behind these crimes? And of me, who sits here doing nothing? The time past caused my ring to dull. Its color had faded, and what a strange thing it is to see an object, an inorganic piece of jewelry, both a symbol of strength and a mere trinket, and connect to it so strongly that it felt more a reflection of my heart than my own appearance. I cradled the ring. It did nothing to fill the hollow swelling within me. 
Harrington Academy carried a somber tone in its halls. Good morning, Mr. McKenzie. I won't be able to say that for, for forever after this. I'm going to be sad. There appears to be an awful cold going around at this time, quite sadly. We have a number of students who are absent because of it. A wonderful thing, I believe, helps is some ginger tea. Not only do I drink it to stay the common cold, but I drink it to stay the winter's cold. We've likely not seen the last of it, but be of good cheer. Spring is almost here. I hope Emily will be back before spring. Don't waste your time fretting over others when there is work to be done at present, Watson. Holmes's eyes never once left the blackboard. Watson's shoulders drooped. You've always been one to keep to yourself, but you've gotten worse of late. You're so busy, you go straight back to the office as soon as school is done and hold yourself up. Enough. You're breaking my concentration. The students were wrapped in a certain silence that was louder than the lesson being learned or the scratching of pen on paper. It's always so quiet now. As it ought to be during lessons. No one seems pleased with it, though. If Emily were here... It's simply back to what it was before, really. There is no cause for alarm. And as Akachi said, that's how it ought to be. You understand that lessons and socializing are two separate things, don't you? I... I'm a government-sponsored exchange student. I wouldn't be here if I didn't know. To counter her claim, Kobayashi dipped his pen in his ink and began writing with rushed strokes. Before even one sentence was completed, however, he stopped. Maybe quiet wasn't the right word. Class without Emily, Lupin, and Jack is... lonely. So Lupin and Jack are also gone. I mean, Jack... That, both of those make sense. Jack worked with Spellbound, and has probably had to go into hiding. Lupin also betrayed the organization and has had to go into hiding. Man. Those are three big powerhouses to lose in this class. The entire room followed. There was no more pen to paper. No more pretending silence was better, but a simultaneous confronting of the loneliness they all knew from the beginning to be present. The bell chimed, indicating the end of lessons for the day. We're leaving, Watson. Oh! Oh, wait! Wait! Watson! Why not come visit Emily with me now? As much as I'd love to say yes, I'm afraid there's a massive pile of work waiting at the office. Is there? Well, you're just as busy as Holmes these days, aren't you? Another time, then. We have a mountain waiting for us as well, Kobayashi. There is much to be done and very little time to do it. Maybe so, but work will always be there. Wouldn't you rather visit Emily for today? I don't believe my answer will make a difference. Come, work is waiting. Oh, wait! Akachi! Don't leave me behind! I'd best trot off after Holmes. He'll never be a man of patience. After returning to their Baker Street office, Holmes and Watson were forced to spend hours filing paperwork with no time to rest. Where is our report of the case from the other day? Sorry! I had something else to take care of, so I haven't noted them yet. Holmes furrowed his brow. I know your pace better than anyone. That report was never meant to be so time-consuming that it couldn't be done even if you had other work in your pile. I know, but I went to see Dad last night. Said he has something important to discuss with me. Like why he doesn't show up in this game, Watson? Watson responded in a distant, vague manner, looking to Holmes as though he wished to say more on the subject but had too many doubts to vocalize it. Very well. Have it done tonight. He spoke with disinterest. All his focus lay on the latest document he retrieved in their sorting venture. Did Holmes not press Watson further out of consideration? Did other matters capture him more? Watson did not know and he could not ask. He simply sighed away the confusion. Oh. 
It could be said that he almost never knew which it was on these occasions. Holmes's expression when sifting through case reports was always very stern, concentrated. Watson could ask again another time as he did this time and many times in the past, but he expected the results to be the same. Alas, the cycle would continue. You'll always be Holmes, won't you? If you have time to be looking gormless, you have time to work. Yes, yes, I know. Holmes has been looking into a mass of old cases ever since the British Museum. These ones from the Yard's headquarters are only a part of them. The assistant supposed it would be best to go through papers and permit his mind to roam into unfavorable territory. Spellbound is waiting. Somewhere amongst these cases, very deliberately, in hopes the truth would never come to light, they wait. And that was all the motivation we needed to start looking. Yet the darkness that took root in the British Empire soil was deep-seated, and it was mighty. Neither had the bravery to put it into words, but Holmes and Watson knew the same sense of powerlessness as Emily. Hello, Hudson. Look at this place! A lawless land if I've ever seen one! I slaved away brewing my finest tea for you, and you can't be blessed to give me any space for it! It's a mess from your perspective. But everything is in perfect order for me. Don't move anything. Thanks for the tea. I'll clear up a spot on the table for it. What did I just say, Watson? Don't mind it. I was going out to sort this all out to begin with. Hudson slyly placed the tea on the table so as not to disturb. Thanks again, Hudson. It's just what I needed. <laughs> Pooh! You're always a wet blanket, Holmes. <laughs> He's drinking without complaint, though, so it must be to his standard. By the way, did, did Emily attend school today? No. She was home today as well. Oh. I know how busy you've been, but surely it wouldn't hurt to pay her a visit? Holmes kept to his reading, fully absorbed, taking little notice of the teacup in hand. Nor did he pay Hudson so much as a courteous nod in his responses. Beg pardon, your majesty! I know you can hear me. You can respond! I'm trying to work this through my head. You take care of this, Watson. Good lord. Well, I don't think I need to speak for Holmes, but I've tried to visit a few times. Pendleton's turned me away at the door each time, sadly. I was hoping it would be different with you. He's never once let me inside. Oh, but I shall get past him next time! I'll make her something absolutely spectacular, then... Whether you can get through the front door or not hinges entirely on that butler. You may bake a cake so delicious that it would put a patissier to shame, and still be turned away at the door if he cho chose it. Shan't hope for the best when the worst is more likely. Holmes, have you- I haven't gone to see her, no. Why would I? My time is too precious to waste on someone who refuses to leave her own home. Those who need something badly enough will simply go out into the world and get it. You can be honest, my friend. You're worried. It's alright to come out and say it. Watson shrugged his shoulders and resumed sorting. Okay, so Pendleton's re refusing everybody. Would he let Lupin in, though, is the question. I do miss her. Without her, it's like we've all gone our separate ways. The Christmas party was so much fun with everyone. Are we never going to have anything like that again? Please, Hudson. I shall get out of your hair now. Best of luck on your work. Tidy away these cups before you go, if you would. And leave it to brew twice as long next time. You're wasting the tea's fragrance like this. You do nothing but complain! Well, bother your complaints! You do whatever you like with them! What boys? Boys were a trouble they were! Hudson stormed out of the room. Oh, that's no good. You could have worded that very differently, you know. 
It was when Watson leaves for a particular set, irritation reaching a boiling point, and no more shrugging or sighs left with which to express himself, that something had changed. Hmm? Sounds as though we've got another guest. Are we due for a client today? We can't invite someone here with the room in this state. I'll see to them. Aha! Aren't we suddenly eager? A detective like Holmes was serious. Always serious, always having his patience tested by the unserious. He was like this exactly till just moments ago, but... Well, this wasn't the time. A new case may have been beyond their door, and the expectant twinkle in his eyes could not be dimmed. What? What are you doing here? Mycroft? Ah, I want to see Emily. Less complaining and more working. Those documents aren't going to sort themselves. I'd be happy to if you didn't keep bringing me new ones. I finished the old ones. Are you sure you're putting everything where it's meant to be? Of course. Learning to read quickly is an important factor of my studies. There's no method more efficient for gathering information. See here. This one is about the war the British Empire is fighting in the Transvaal region of South Africa to wrest control from the local Boers. Japan is in the midst of building friendly relations with Engels, but we have much to learn from events such as these. We must always be aware of the politics of the world around us. I know. But I just don't have the mind for world politics when I'm more concerned with something closer to home. It's not right to leave a friend in need alone, you know. Kobayashi, are you? Before Akachi could finish, the two heard someone knocking at their door. It's the Avengers Initiative. It's Nick Fury coming to get all the detectives together. Oh? Seems we've got a visitor. Were we due for one? No, it must be a new client. Brilliant! I might have gone mad if I had to keep sorting documents. Just a minute! I'll be right there! Kobayashi dashed to open the door without pause, ignoring Akachi entirely, who was shaking his head in disapproval of his friend's impulsiveness. It was precisely who they were not expecting to see. H hello I never thought I'd see you here! Who is it, Kobayashi? Wait. What brings you here? Who's calling on whom? Who's on second? I got questions. Oh, it could also be Jack slash Lupin going to the boys. Maybe. Maybe. I didn't think about that either. This is hopeless. No matter how many times I read through it, not a single word sticks. I made many attempts to read through old newspapers and case files. The more these attempts were made, the less I could concentrate. Eventually, I gave up. To try and try again made no difference. I found that staring blankly at the ceiling, my body comfortably in bed a more productive use of time. The scream of the wind blowing lodged itself in my ears. The gale had grown strong, strong enough to rattle the windows and give the mansion elderly creaks throughout its foundation. I wish wind like this didn't remind me of that night. Why did I have to think of it now? I lacked the health to recall their murders endlessly without adding to my grief. I lacked the passion to see to the closure of my childhood nightmare when I was raised to crave it. I fell deeper into depression. To close my eyes wasn't enough. I placed my hands over my ears, pressed into them till it was uncomfortable to keep out the wind. Marple. Hudson. Kobayashi. Lupin. Jack. Akachi. Holmes. Watson. Everyone. I thought of their faces. They were so recent, so vivid, and the Christmas we had was one to treasure. So why did the memory make me so unhappy? Like the lonesome period after catharsis experienced upon finishing a good book, or like a jovial story recounted by a friend before bidding them goodbye and being left behind. Yes. Like these things, the memory only left me with a self-loathing that was becoming too much to bear.